This afternoon, the Senate Judiciary Committee is holding a hearing on what's being called the most historic criminal justice reform proposal in decades. The measure would reduce mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenders while also increasing mandatory minimum sentences for other offenses, including interstate domestic violence. It would also ban solitary confinement for juveniles and bolster rehab programs for some inmates. The hearing comes amid growing momentum for sweeping criminal justice reform, including a major push by President Obama, who touted the Senate bill during his weekly address. And I'm encouraged by these kinds of bipartisan efforts. It's real progress. Not liberal ideas or conservative ideas, but common sense solutions to the challenges we face. We pledge allegiance to one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. And justice means that every child deserves a chance to grow up safe and secure without the threat of violence. Justice means that the punishment should fit the crime. And justice means allowing our fellow Americans who've made mistakes to pay their debt to society. Well, the bill is being backed by key leaders on both parties, and a similar measure is also making its way through the House. MSNBC chief legal correspondent Ari Melber is joining me now. Also joining us is Anthony Papa with the Drug Policy Alliance. Anthony spent a dozen years in a state prison for a nonviolent drug offense and is now an advocate against the so-called war on drugs. So, guys, it's good to have you here. First to you, Ari, can you explain just how significant this would be if this gets signed into law? If this were signed into law, as you just mentioned, it would be, Alex, one of the largest changes to federal, federal prison enforcement and sentencing in a generation, especially, as we know, in a period where we've seen the war on drugs rely on these harsh sentences for drug sentencing it, throughout the system. I want to bring in Anthony Papa, who's here. We've spoken to policymakers today about this. We're speaking to you as someone who's been through it uh, in New York. Tell us about your story. Well, I was a first-time nonviolent offender uh, in 1985. I made the biggest mistake of my life. Got involved with drug activity. I, I passed an envelope with four and a half ounces of cocaine to undercover officers for the sum of $500. Uh, for that, I made every mistake you can make, and I wound up going to prison. I was sentenced to 15 years to life. While in prison, I, I didn't... Now, on that point, so that, was that your first offense? First time nonviolent drug offense. So you're, Never you're, you're really before. an example of what people talk about in this, where your first time in the criminal justice system, no gun, no violence, Nothing. right? And Nothing. you got 15 to life. Yes, 15 to life. It was a nightmare experience for me. And while I was in prison, I, you know, I took advantage of the rehabilitative programs, got three college degrees, discovered my talent as an artist. One night I was sitting in my cell, picked up a mirror, looked in the mirror, saw an individual who's going to spend the most productive years of life in a cage, painted the self-portrait, 15 to life. Seven years later, I wound up at the Whitney Museum of American Art. I got a lot of publicity on my case. I came out. But that's when the story begins, because then I wanted to save those left behind, so I started being an advocate. Right. Uh, against the, the strict mandatory minimum sentencing laws. And you, in your case changed in part because George Pataki, the governor of New York, did Grant, intervene, right? Right, he, he granted me executive clemency. Uh, he was a, considered a, a moderate Republican. I want to play some sound from a conservative Republican we interviewed just this morning who's also backing this bill, Senator Mike Lee. Let's listen to that. Certainly one can point to the fact that it costs about $30,000 a year to put somebody in federal prison, and that is a consideration. But, you know, it's, it's my view and the view of most of the people working on the bill that the biggest costs that we're worried about here are not just the financial ones, but the human costs. The fact that we've got husbands and fathers and uncles and, and nephews and husbands who are locked up sometimes for years or even decades at a time. In many instances, locked up much longer than they need to be locked up in order to protect the public and serve right. the interest of justice. What, what does it mean to you to hear a, a Tea Party Republican there talking about kind of your situation, uh, family members locked away for what he says is too long? I think it's fantastic. I think it's a, f a first a good step. Uh, we need more to be done. But to do away with mandatory minimum sentencing, it's a great move. I, it's going to save a lot of lives, people who return into society who are ready to return as, as citizens. You know. and, and the last thing I just want to ask you briefly is what, what do you say to young people who, who look at your story or people who, who don't have hope um, and are worried about all these problems? What, what do you say with everything you've been through? I say people make mistakes in their lives and they need second chances. So I, uh, President Obama, I, my hat is off to him for trying to do away with mass incarceration and I hope people 
uh, 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 follow the steps that are going to reform these laws and help people to come home to return to their families. Right, which, which you were able to do, but after a long struggle, a journey. Anthony right. Papa, thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much. Back to you. Yeah, Alex. you know what I like about that? Look at Anthony. He went and got a college education a couple of times over. I mean, good for you for, for doing the most you could during your time there in prison. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for that discussion.